Okay. So um, over the past year, the Institute has actually been getting 10th anniversary presents. Um, this comes in the form of brilliant young scientists that are showing up at our doorstep. Uh, it's really been an amazing time for the Institute as we're looking at this new decade. We're growing rapidly, um, and it seems like every week uh, there's some new, young, talented person that's coming to join the mission, and it's really exciting. So uh, with that introduction, Sean, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've chosen one of our, our new young scientists who's joined very recently uh, to, to talk about some of the work that he's done and will continue to do at the Institute. Well, so welcome, Sean. Well, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's a real honor. Uh, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about uh, now working at the Institute and uh, helping to contribute to the, the new research programs. Uh, since I just joined uh, the Institute three months ago, most of the work I'll talk about today uh, was actually conducted while I was a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the lab of Massimo Scanziani at the University of California, San Diego. So like many neuroscientists, I've been drawn to the study of the cerebral cortex primar primarily because it's responsible for our most unique uh, human abilities. We think with it, we speak with it, we create art with it, it underlies our conscious experience. Yet all mammals have a cerebral cortex, from the mandrel to the mouse. And the remarkable thing is that if you look at the microscopic level, at the detailed cellular architecture, it's remarkably similar from humans to mice. For over 100 years, we've known that in the cortex, there are many diverse cell types that are organized into a layered structure. And the cortex is substantially more complex than this uh, stain here shows. These are just the cell bodies. There is a jungle of wires that interconnect all of these cells together. And despite knowing about this basic uh, cellular architecture, we have relatively little idea uh, about what the function of this circuitry uh, uh, is doing. And so in my work at uh, UCSD, and now here at the Allen Institute, um, uh, we're using the mouse visual system as a model for understanding the cortex in general. And really the backdrop for all of this work is the pioneering research of uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. So over 50 years ago, they discovered that neurons in the primary visual cortex are selectively responsive to uh, oriented bars of light. For example, this neuron here responds to vertical bars, but not horizontal bars. Uh, David Hubel recently passed away, and I read a memorable line in the, in the newspaper. I said, this research launched a thousand microelectrodes. <laughs> and it, it's really true. Orientation selectivity is it, it's, it captures the imagination. It suggests how the brain begins to represent basic features of the, of the visual world. And in addition, it is a property that emerges in the cortex. So the input to the visual cortex, the thalamus, the neurons there don't care about the orientation to a first approximation. They respond to patches of light or darkness like shown on this screen. And Hubel and uh, Wiesel came up with a, a very nice, simple model for explaining how uh, orientation selectivity might emerge. They postulated that thalamic neurons with circularly symmetric receptive fields were aligned in uh, uh, an edge, and they selectively wired up to a single visual cortex neuron thereby endowing it with orientation selectivity. And this model has really stood the test of time. Uh, but what, what is somewhat remarkable, and 
interesting is that it doesn't invoke the complex circuitry of the cortex at all. It all derives from the convergence of the thalamic inputs. So this one visual cortex neuron resides in here in a sea of other cells. W what is all of this uh, circuitry for? So what we would like to do is to selectively intervene or perturb distinct cell types in a very selective way and ask how that influences processing within the circuitry. And this is where the, the awesome power of mouse genetic technology comes into play. So this is a slice of a mouse brain. Front of the brain here, the cerebellum at the back. The cortex is this structure on the uh, outer part of the brain. And this is a, a very beautiful transgenic Cree mouse line in which only neurons in cortical layer 6 express Cree. And Cree is a molecular switch that allows us to express effector proteins in these neurons, like a, a fluorescent protein or a light-sensitive optogenetic tool that can allow us to control the activity of these neurons selectively without directly uh, interacting with other neurons that are uh, intertwined within the circuitry. So in the first experiments I'll tell you about, I took this exact mouse line and took some of the tools that uh, Viviana talked about uh, to either activate or suppress neurons in layer 6 while monitoring visual activity in the cortex of the mouse. The basic experiment goes like this. We've got a mouse that is viewing a monitor in which we're displaying bars of various orientations. I use a multi-channel probe to record the electrical activity across the depth of the cortex. And the neurons in layer 6, in this case, express halorhodopsin, a light-sensitive protein that when we shine orange light on them, suppresses their activity. And so in this experiment, we show the animal visual stimulus with or without suppression of layer 6 and ask what is different. So here is an example of one neuron that's located in layer 4. Keep in mind, this neuron is not directly uh, activated or uh, suppressed by uh, the light stimulus onto layer 6. Uh, but it is driven by a visual stimulus, and this particular neuron is orientation-tuned. A bar that is horizontal and drifting up elicits a response from it, while a visual stimulus that is vertical, drifting to the right, elicits no response. In the orange trials, we silenced or suppressed the activity in layer 6 before we started delivering the visual stimulus. And what you can see is that the response is facilitated, or it's, it's larger when layer 6 uh, is suppressed, which suggests that the default state was that layer 6 was actually suppressing the activity in layer 4. The interesting thing, though, is that it doesn't occur for all orientations in a uniform manner, but the facilitation is, scales with the magnitude of the visual response. And the cool thing about this is that the selectivity of the neuron, the preferred orientation, and the relative response to the different orientations is maintained. And this represents what is called a gain change. So layer 6 can control the gain of the responses without changing the type of feature that uh, the neuron is responding to. So we can do a similar experiment in which we put channel rhodopsin an option that allows us to activate layer 6. And in this case, when we ectopically activate layer 6 while using visual stimuli to drive the neuron, we find that the response is suppressed, which is what we would predict based on the, the opposite effect for the suppression of layer 6. And similarly, we see that the tuning curve of, of the neuron, the shape is relatively unchanged. It's just the relative intensity of response. 
So the way that I think about this is that we have learned something about how cortical layer six can impact the activity in the other layers. But this doesn't really tell us what the function of, of that mo gain modulation is. To get at that, we need to know who is turning this knob. What are the inputs to layer six of V1? Because this will tell us uh, when this gain modulation comes into play. So one of the very nice new uh, online resources from the Allen Institute is the Mouse Connectivity Atlas. So uh, this, this atlas provides a uh, coarse wiring diagram of the mouse brain. So I went into this tool and I chose the primary visual cortex as the structure that I wanted to find the inputs to. And the, the first source of inputs to V1, predictably, is the thalamus, the lateral geniculate input, which is well known to innervate layer four. But all of these other dots on the brain also provide some input to uh, the visual cortex. And I've just highlighted three of them here. These are three uh, different cortical areas, all that send a projection to various areas of the brain, but one of those areas is V1, and the interesting thing is that they selectively innervate cortical layer six. So in this way, these other cortical areas could be modulating the activity of V1. And we don't know exactly what the retrosplenal cortex does or the posterior parietal cortex, but based on data from humans and primate work, these regions are involved in cognitive functions like attention, motor feedback, navigation. And so the general hypothesis is that the orientation selectivity in V1 doesn't require layer six. It's established through other means, probably through the convergence of the precise wiring of the thalamic input. But that processing within this structure can be modulated Via, via layer six according to behavioral cognitive demands. <coughs> to test these hypotheses, we have to train mice to perform various behavioral tasks. And while I can't uh, provide any uh, answers to these specific questions, I'd like to tell you about a behavioral paradigm that I have developed over the past couple of years that I think ultimately will allow us to address these questions. So this task I call the virtual foraging task. It's really inspired by uh, some of the work in the lab of David Tank in which they've developed a virtual reality system for mice. Uh, this is a little simpler. A mouse runs on a circular disk and the movement of this disk is coupled to the movement of objects along a computer monitor. The goal of the mouse is to run to and stop at target objects whereupon they get a sugar water reward. So in a sense, they are, they're foraging for rewards and the rewards are indicated by the particular visual stimuli down this, what can be thought of as a virtual hallway. And a, a movie demonstrates that the mice can perform this task very well. So in this case, the target is an upright black square, and all of the other objects, rotated squares, are distractors. Whoops. There you go. He stops on the, on the black square, gets his reward, continues running along. And if you watch very closely, you can see that he's very engaged in this task. He'll slow down to get a closer look at difficult uh, discriminations, very slight rotations. I really like this task because it engages the mouse's natural instincts to run around and, and, and forage for things. In the past, people have claimed that mice are very difficult to train to do tasks. Uh, but I found that virtually every mouse, dozens of mice, can, can learn this particular task. 
And we can quantify their performance by plotting the probability that they stop on each of the different objects along this virtual hallway. So the target object, this guy is stopping over 90% of the time. He never stops for the white square and is able to resolve slight rotations of, of the square less than 15 degrees. So I told you uh, a lot about orientation selectivity uh, in the primary visual cortex. So an in initial question is whether V1 is involved in this particular task. Now I address this question by uh, optogenetically silencing the visual cortex while the animal was performing this task. And the trick I used here was to put channel rhodopsin into inhibitory neurons. When we activate those neurons, we can shine a light actually directly through the skull of the mouse. We can completely silence a uh, chunk of cortical tissue. So one thing I'll point out also is that the monitor is placed such that the mouse can only view it with its right eye. So the relevant hemisphere is the contralateral one, the one on the left here. So this shows a running trajectory of a mouse that is performing this uh, experiment. There are, are, I show six objects along this track. And I pulled this particular segment out because there are four targets in a row. Well, you can see with this blue line is the position of the animal along this track as a function of time. So he's running along at a constant speed. At this moment, before the next object comes on the screen, we silence the visual cortex. It doesn't disrupt his running behavior. He continues on as if nothing apparently has happened, but he runs right past the target stimulus. Then at that point, when the, that object leaves the screen, we remove the silencing, and within one second, he's able to correctly identify the next target. He stops here, consumes his reward, begins running again, now we're silencing the visual cortex again. He runs right past the next object as if he doesn't even see it. Uh, so this is a pretty striking result. And you know, one wonders whether there's some, some artifact. Maybe it's just very unpleasant to have uh, your visual cortex silenced. Uh, and he just wants to you know, run as fast as he can to avoid uh, uh, that, that sensation. So I performed uh, several controls to look at this. One of them is to silence the equivalent hemisphere uh, on the other side of the brain, same amount of cortical tissue, same modality, visual cortex, but because uh, it's on the uh, right side of the brain, it is representing the left visual field, which is not involved in this task. What we can see clearly here is that silencing the visual cortex on the irrelevant side has no impact on the behavior whatsoever, whereas silencing the relevant contralateral uh, V1 severely disrupts the behavior. So can the mouse see anything at all? Um, in this particular version of the task, I am silencing the cortex in an episodic way for a second at a time. And in between silencing, uh, there's a window of opportunity for the animal to uh, get rewards. Uh, what happens if we do a sustained silencing such that uh, if he wants to get any rewards at all, he, he has to try to perform the task in the face of, of his cortex being silenced? So if we silence the cortex for an extended period of time, 20 minute blocks, a different pattern of behavior emerges. First, for the ipsilateral uh, silencing, there's, there's no difference between control. But when we're silencing the contralateral relevant hemisphere, the, the animal initially runs past the objects as if he doesn't see them, but eventually starts stopping on black squares but he's unable to tell the difference between the target upright square and the rotated square. It's interesting, though, that he still has the capability of telling black from white. So this suggests that the visual cortex is critical for orientation discrimination, 
but it's not essential for the animal to tell uh, whether it's a, a stimulus is on the screen or not, black from white. Uh, this function is probably mediated by a parallel pathway that goes through the superior colliculus, and though we haven't tested this yet. But more generally, it's, it's somewhat remarkable to me that the animal still is performing the task. He still knows the rules of the task. He has the proper sensory motor coordination uh, to run to and stop on objects. He just doesn't have the proper representation of the visual stimuli. So presumably, his knowledge of the rules of this task and how to perform it is engaging and is encoded in different parts of the brain. And by systematically inactivating the cortex, we could begin to address uh, which of these regions are involved in that particular task. Uh, so I want to end with, with one final uh, behavioral session. Uh, another nice thing about this task is that once the animals learn, learn the rules of the game, that they forage for rewarded objects, uh, they can learn lots of different types of discriminations and we can introduce more complex visual stimuli. Uh, so this is actually an experiment that was suggested by Alan Jones. Thank you. Uh, this mouse was originally trained on a orientation discrimination task, um, but then learned this new task uh, over the course of a week, fairly rapidly. <laughs> this, is, this is a real mouse, very smart mouse. OK, so he likes Kristoff. Kristoff <laughs> is, is the giver of water. Uh, Hong Kui, Clay, no. Alan, sorry. <laughs> and there he goes. So this, th this guy is very good. And you can see that he actually can recognize two different uh, images of Kristoff. Um, and is only slightly confused with, with Clay. Uh, uh, so, so finally, just very briefly, uh, going forward, in order to understand behavior, I think we, we need to think about two levels of, of the nervous system at least, uh, which is interactions between brain areas, knowledge of uh, behavioral tasks, attention, working memory, uh, in, encoding of uh, stimuli in the world. Um, but we also have to think about how these brain regions interact with one another. And it's becoming clear that the interactions between brain areas are highly selective and that they utilize precise microcircuitry within, within an area. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, give a few acknowledgments. First of all, all of this, virtually all of this work was done in Massimo Scanziani's lab, a uh, fantastic mentor and clear scientific thinker. I got support from the Helen Hay Whitney Foundation. Thanks to the mice who are smarter than I imagined. And uh, a very big thanks to Paul and jo Jody Allen for really unprecedented support for figure trying to figure out the mysteries of the brain. So thank you. So since you mentioned Hubel and Wiesel, yeah. the uh, question is, uh, do you have a way of inactivating just specific uh, ocular dominance columns or their equivalent in the mouse? So in the mouse, uh, there are not ocular dominance columns. Most of the visual cortex is actually monocular. There's a very small binocular strip. And uh, we could try to selectively uh, inactivate that area. But I've tried to stay away uh, from the binocular region just because it's a little more complex. I guess I, I was kind of getting at the idea that the uh, sister neurons in a clone tend to wire together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the broader question of can we do a more precise optogenetic manipulation where we're not silencing the entire visual cortex, but we're focusing in 
with a high level of precision on functionally identified cells, maybe cells that only are responsive to vertical bars or something like that. We would love to be able to do this, and it's, it's only a matter of time, but currently we're una unable to do that experiment. So one, one of the issues you have to contend with in any kind of brain perturbation experiment, whether it's a lesion or optogenetic inhibition, yeah. is that if you're comparing an easy task to a hard task, anything you do to the brain is likely to impair the hard task before it impairs the easy task. Yeah. And experimental psychologists know this for decades. And so mm -hmm. your result that silencing the visual cortex doesn't impair the discrimination between the white, uh, uh, the white square and the dark square, but yeah. does impair the discrimination between the different orientation yeah. dark squares, has a bit of that flavor. And I'm sure this isn't going to be the first or the last time that, that you encounter this. The question is, how do you think about this? And have you thought about task design in a way that you can create control tasks that are equivalently challenging, but maybe leverage or load on different aspects of visual perception so that you can, you can tell the difference between whether you're really perturbing a perceptual task or you're just generating a mouse that doesn't see very well. If it doesn't see very well, then it's going to be able to make very crude discriminations, but not fine ones. That is a very, very difficult question. And that's exactly right. We have a lot of thinking to do about the right experimental methodology going forward. Right now, my experiments have been mostly proof of principle. And these are somewhat arbitrary objects. Uh, but certainly, we want to explore the psychophysical space of you know, the mouse to identify what types of stimuli uh, are difficult for it to discriminate, what are its discrimination thresholds, contrast thresholds, all of this we hope to explore so that you know, we have some sort of reference frame for you know, where we're operating. Yeah, absolutely.